Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation and for organizing this workshop. It's been a, a tremendous workshop so far. So I've changed the title of my talk. Uh, um, and the idea being that instead of talking about one particular set of results, I want to give an overview of, of some results, some ongoing work, and, and some ideas. Um, and they're all somehow uh, linked. Um, so they all relate to robust pricing, hedging in discrete time. But they relate to somehow my effort uh, of trying to understand how to make the current body of work a bit more dynamic and then a bit more applicable with the ideas of actually producing something that could be um, implemented in practice. Whether I get there or not, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's not clear at the moment, but what, what is clear is I think is that there's many interesting mathematics that come out of, of, of trying to make this, this, this setting a bit more dy dynamic. Um, <clears throat> and it will become clear in a moment what I mean by this. Uh, but somehow, essentially, you can think of this of trying to understand how to, um, if you think about a classical setting in my finance, um, you do, we do things with postulating a, a model and then calibrating it. Okay? And then the, the, the day after in the industry, or maybe the week after, you have to recalibrate, somehow throw away your model and, and, and change it. And the idea is that the robust setting should, by um, treating market inputs in a different way, should allow you to make this into somehow a coherent uh, framework. So you'd like to have a way of understanding how to treat new incoming data or information consistently and coherently in your framework, um, but also use the past data in order to estimate what you do in future. Okay. So here's the setup. Okay. Um, I'll work in discrete time. Everything is in discounted units, um, and I'll have no frictions. I'll have some D assets which are statically, dynamically traded. They'll be denoted S. And for the purpose of the stock, there will be just the canonical process on my uh, space RD times the number of steps. I have some statically traded assets, which are the options. You can think of them as options. They're available today for buy and hold, but you cannot assume a priori they will be available tomorrow, although we'll see in a moment that, in fact, you may want to do this, and that makes your life easier while well, it doesn't change the problem. So trading at the moment is done through two, two ways. So there is a buy and hold. So this is just a vector of positions in the phi. And then there is a predictable process H. And together, they produce a wealth, which starts from little x, gives you the discrete stochastic integral, so the usual formula, and then the, the static position in your options. So what's the model? OK, so far it was all. Anyway, it's modeling assumptions, but it's just a very general um, set of, of, of generic assumptions. Um, so the model can be formulated in two ways. And one of those is, I'll refer to as pathwise. And the other one, quasi-sure. One of the things I want to say today is that, in fact, they're, they're really equivalent. You can go from one to another and back. Uh, so this will be a quite theoretical start to what hopefully uh, uh, tries to be then more applied talk. Uh, so a pathwise setting is very simple. A model is just a selection of feasible trajectories. Okay. That's all. It's really pathwise. You specify paths or, or points if this is a general omega, and you say I only care about those points, but I do care about those points. Okay. In the quasi-sure, you specify a set of measures, or cloud of measures on your x, and you say these are uh, all models in terms of probabilistic specifications that I want to consider. And I'll have some references as, as talk develops. Um, so the quasi-sure setting was really understood and developed by Marcel and Bruno. Um, and the pathwise setting has maybe more uh, varied history, but um, Matteo with two Marcos have two papers, and then we had a, another paper where we had options um, with my student Joshua and the same uh, Milan team. Okay. So that's for me a specification of a model. Okay. So this is a selection of paths. Okay. 
And this is a selection of probability measures. So the first object which you consider in this setting is typically as the super hedging price. And accordingly, it will have a slightly different meaning. So the super hedging price here um, depends on the set of paths, depends on your trading instruments. And is the smallest initial capital such that you can um, super replicate your payoff on the set of omega, path by path. Well, in this uh, quasi-sure setting, you replace the last inequality uh, from pathwise to uh, quasi-sure. So whenever I'll have a set of measures here, I'll implicitly assume I'm talking about the quasi-sure object. So whenever I have a set of paths, I'll be thinking about pathwise object. So this is p almost surely for any p in your set. And I'm slightly slow because I didn't tell you what the filtration is. And you can think of this as universally completed natural filtration. And there are some subtleties around when you want to consider general Polish space and filtrations in Amnok. So there will be a certain amount of technical details which I'll swipe under the carpet throughout the talk. <coughs> so these are the things of prime interest in finance, let's say. What are the pricing instruments of so the dual elements for that? They'll be the martingale measures. So I want to be, I want S is a Q martingale. I want this measure to be concentrated on the set of paths <coughs> which I selected as my model. And I wanted to reprice the instruments which are available in the market. And the very similar definition will be here with the uh, only change that you replace the support sort of condition by the condition that they should be absolutely continuous with respect to some measure in the set. <laughs> Martingale measure and again calibrated. So this is the setup. And the first thing you might want to understand is a fundamental theorem of asset pricing. And again, this was done in both of those settings. So the understanding is quite slightly different. This is all really uh, repeating known arguments. <clears throat> in the quasi-sure setting, you sort of think of coming from the setting of one probability measure and building up uncertainty. So Intuitively, all of those models should be treated seriously. Um, and so the no arbitrage condition here means that if you have something that starts from zero and is non-negative, then in fact, it's equal to zero. So this is um, a weak notion of arbitrage. So a strong notion of no arbitrage. And you get a nice equivalence with existence of Martingale measures, uh, which are uh, which dominate any measure in P. If you think about the pathwise setting, okay, then you replace existence of a lot of Martingale measures by existence of one calibrated Martingale measure, and likewise you have a, a much weaker no arbitrage condition, so absence of a much stronger arbitrage. So strong arbitrage here is that. This is positive on omega. Okay, strictly positive. Um, so it's on every path you have a, you have a gain. There are 
technical details in these statements. So in Bouchard Nutz, there is a certain structural assumptions about convexity and then certain analytic properties of the graphs of the kernels. So I'll just refer to this as APS, analytic product structure. Okay? If you know the papers, you know the assumptions. If, if not, uh, there's a set of assumptions. Um, and here, what happens is that you have to introduce a larger filtration. Somehow intuitively, what happens is that um, you may have different arbitrage strategies and you want to aggregate them in a single one. And for this, you have to know a little bit of polar sets. Okay? So this, this, this filtration does not change the set of Martingale measures, but it changes um, the way you trade and aggregates this into, in fact, a one arbitrage aggregator. So there exists a strategy here, which gives you a potential arbitrage because it's non-negative on, on omega. And in fact, um, you're really interested in the set where it's, where it's equal to zero. So the pre-image of where the strategy is equal to zero um, is denoted with a star operation. And somehow what happens is that this is, this is where those measures live. So you can take union over Qs in an omega phi. And then I want to look at the support of Q. And to make this somehow meaningful, I'll take only finitely supported measures. Okay? But intuitively, this, is, this, this, star, omega, this star operation um, tells you that you've specified a certain set of paths, but some of them may never be visited by Martingale measures, so you should really ignore them. And you should only select a, a smaller set, uh, which is somehow the efficient paths. So maybe some of the paths that you told me that you cared about, really you should have been ignoring. So how to link those two setups? Um, if you want to go from right to left, uh, sorry, if you want to go from, if you want to use the right to, to use the left, what you want to do is you want to, so if you go, want to go this way somehow, uh, you cannot get this, the whole full strength of this, meaning this, this additional filtration. But what you can get is that if you look at this, which are, uh, well, the convex hull of the um, set of delta Dirac's in omega, where omega is in the set of efficient paths, right, then you will see that somehow this will have the, the nice properties and this really corresponds to pathwise setting. It's a bit more difficult to go this way. So this is a theorem. So that relates to this joint work of my PhD student, Johannes Wiesel. So you can show that for any such set which satisfies the nice assumptions, there exists a selection of paths such that Your measures live on this, on this set, okay, and the following are equivalent. So you get no arbitrage with respect to this, if and only if, in fact, those measures live on and this set depends on set of P, and I want this piece to live on the star. on the star operation. Which then tells you that somehow um, <clears throat> this corresponds to the correct pathwise uh, choice of paths, which encode all the relevant information for, for pricing and hedging on the right-hand side. Is it omega beta? You can take it for n or analytic? So you'll take it in f. You can take it analytic. 
logically measurable, or in, that depends a little bit on the on the particular setup. Okay, but um, here I'll have universally completed filtration, so this will be in a few, but it in fact slightly smaller. Okay, so an example which is always good to have in mind is that if this is equal to a singleton, then This is the so-called Dalang-Morton-Willinger theorem, which was already shown in, in this paper. And this uses um, arguments of Rocklin. And somehow it tells you that you have to somehow select the conditional supports in, 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 a, in a suitable way. So once you have the Fundamental theorem, the next thing is to have pricing hedging duality. And again, you have this in both setups. Um, so let me go back to the divider. Um, so on the right, on the left hand side, what you'll get is that the super hedging price on omega of a claim, and here you can take a measurable claim, will be usually greater um, or equal than the super hedging on this set of efficient paths. And this will be equal to the usual duality. Okay. And this was shown in this paper. On the right hand side, you get um, F upper semi analytic, and then you get that the super hedging price in the quasi true sense is equal to the supreme of expectations. And if you try to do the same thing as we did here, and you try to connect this too, so uh, did you? This one from this one, you see that this is slightly trickier. You somehow have to optimize over all elements which are quasi surely equal to f. So somehow minimize that. And, and you see that to do some sort of min-max argument is precisely where these assumptions come in. And that's why even though we don't have the structure there on omega, we cannot recover this without those assumptions. I think somehow it really allows you to understand where, at least to me, where this comes in. Okay. Um, if I have time, I can talk about this later, but I don't think I'll have time. So what I want to do now is, um, I have to raise sort of for things. I want to mention, um, ooh, that's all I wanted. Very briefly, why you can get rid of the um, statically traded options. And then I want to come to the sort of first um, dynamic question, which is in this pricing hedging duality, there is, um, there is existence of the minimal of the super hedging strategy, which allows you to attain the cost on both sides. Okay? And this natural question is how to select a super hedging strategy. Okay? And we'll see that for this, you can prove existence of sort of minimal super hedging strategies, and we'll consider a secondary utility optimization problem. So that's what I want to do in a second, but first I want to get rid of this vice. Um, and this is somehow an observation that we made with, um, with Anya and then Shalou and, um, and Shike Deng, um, thinking about American options, which were previously studied in those two papers. So if you think about American options, this duality here may fail. And the reason is somehow, even if you've put supreme over stopping times, that you have somehow not enough things on the right hand side. And if you want to get rid of this, here's what you can do. Okay. So you can consider dynamic embedding of the setup with statically traded options where you think I will lift it to a fictitious market where everything, where everything is traded dynamically. Okay. Um, so if you think about pathwise setting, you would think of um, now sets of, this will be in uh, x cross, let's say, r, D or sorry, K 
plus one, and I'm looking at all the paths. So these are the paths for dynamically traded options now. So I didn't even say this, but I've assumed they all have prices zero. I have no friction, so I can always move things by a constant. Okay? And then my terminal payoff should be equal to this vector, and I want omega to be in omega. And if you're doing quasi-sure setting, you will extend this to the probability measures on this x hat now. So I put this and this, and I require um, the payoffs for my options to be, to be satisfied. Okay? And I want the projection, so this restricted to the, to the first coordinate, to belong to my original set of restriction of, uh, let me write it like that. Okay. And the basic observation is that um, even though you've allowed yourself trading in many more instruments, in fact, because you've made strictly no assumptions about those option prices, other than the payoff condition, which you already had, and the initial price, which you already had, in fact, you didn't change the super hedging price at all. Okay? Somehow, a posteriori, this is really quite obvious, but maybe when, when, when you first think of this, this is, uh, this is not so obvious. And the way to see this, let's just see this on the, on the pathwise uh, side, is that if you start with a measure, let's say measure Q, uh, Q hat in, In this setup, in this, uh, this, um, then of course, if you restrict to omega, you get something that was a, a, a martingale measure already on on omega. Another way around, if you start with a martingale measure on omega, what you can do is you can consider the joint distribution of your process S and Y under Q. And you can define the process Y just as simply as the conditional expectations. Okay. And you see that this is now a process uh, SY and its distribution lives here. Okay. So what is somehow obvious is that if you look at the super hedging price with dynamically traded, uh, traded options, then this will be less than the super hedging price when you can only statically trade options. This by the duality above will be the same as the supremium here. Okay, and here, I really want to add that. All right, I need this condition of calibration for this to be I have uh, initial value zero, and uh, and this to be in the set. So by this one-to-one -one correspondence, this is the same as looking at the measures, Martingale measures for the joint dynamics of stock and options, which of course is then again by the weak duality less or equal than the super hedging price and, and everything has to be equal. Okay. So once you have the, the pricing hedging duality, this was the pricing hedging duality for Europeans, you get this in this extended setup. And you can use this to prove very easily the pricing hedging duality for Americans. Okay. So if you consider an American option, um, okay, let me, for a change, let me do this in the, in the quasi-sure setup. Everything works the same in pathwise and quasi-sure, really, it's just you change the, uh, you just change the notation, okay? So let's, let's call this American option now Psi, so this is an option where you can have a stopping time, you exercise, etc. Um, so I think you've already heard that talk on the work of Chaloux and, and Bruno on transaction cost, and this was, there was the idea that it was first uh, um, Chaloux and, 
and, and Xi Jinping had um, to say that this American option, if you consider path time space, okay, so you look at a, pro, a product of omega with time, then the, the American option becomes a European option. So this is the same as European option on, and I'll denote this with, um, with bars for the, uh, for the time extension. Okay, and then now everything is simple. So this is, of course, um, if I now allow to trade dynamically, I've reduced my super hedging price of Americans. This will be now the same, again, by the same idea as I had there. This will be the same as European pricing of the time space for the lifted market. And here I, it's enough to use the weak duality. So this will be supreme of Q sin And now this, this set is the same as if I drop the hat. Um, and this by pre the European pricing hedging duality is the same as the European option. Okay, and again, you have a chain of inequalities which become all equality. And you can then represent this here because here on this set, the advantage is that on this set you have dynamic programming principle. So you can see that this is the same as supremum of queues and supremum of stopping times. Now in the natural filtration of the process with the options. Okay. So you get the natural duality for Americans with the natural stopping times for your stock price process and the options traded dynamically. Okay, so I reckon I have about five minutes left. Not even. Um, so I'll try to talk about some new stuff. Um, so I'll try to, I'll talk now about the minimal super hedging. Okay. So the question is now, so you may expect that this in practice might be true, that you might have uh, quotes of our options coming tomorrow and the day after, etc. So the question is how to roll, roll over your dynamic or your robust hedging. Okay. So what do I mean by this? Okay. So in the works above on those pricing and duality, on both sides there was an implicit sort of DPP principle. Okay, which somehow tells you that if you look at the super hedging price at time t, so now this is random, okay? Uh, this will be the same as expectation, and you have to take measures which are, um, so this is random ft, f little t measurable, okay? So in my pathwise setting, it's slightly easier to understand those things in pathwise setting. This is just the super hedging price on the ft atom of omega, and then you have to star it. Okay. So this is constant on atoms, and then you have to take, you have to then intersect it with omega and take the star operation. And here you get atoms concentrated on this, measures concentrated on that. Okay. And I'm skipping now phi's because I can somehow understand that I don't really need phi's anymore. I'm just thinking about everything dynamically traded. So how do you compute this? If you do just one step, this is really quite simple. Okay. So if you, if you have one step, then the super hedging of F is nothing else but the concave envelope of F taken on the set omega star evaluated at S0. Okay. So this is... Um, So this is the concave envelope of your function on a set at the point. So what do I mean by this? So FCCA of X um, is the infimum of uh, U of X, where U is greater or equal than F 
on A and concave. Concave. And if t is greater than one, then you have to iterate the procedure. Okay. So we can show that the, so let me write it here. Well, you start with f, and then you let ft be, so this depends now on omega zero, omega one, all the way to omega little t. This will be the, you look at your value of the superhedging one step ahead, and then you take concave envelope on the, on this atom intersected with what can happen next. So let me write this like that. So this is somehow in one step, you can really see that this is concave envelope. One inequality is just Jensen's inequality. The other one comes from the fact that such an operation, if you index it with the Barry center, is a concave function which dominates things. So, and then you, you do this sort of step by step. And you can see that this super hedging price at F is equal to this concave envelope. And not only this, but this is also equal to, um, you can write this as some hedging strategy. But if you do the hedging, then of course you did too much, so you have to subtract some consumption. So there exists some optimal investment and consumption process now, which allows you to exactly realize the, the super hedging. Okay, and it's not hard to see that this is a minimal um, super martingale in the sense that it's a super martingale under all measures in your in your set of measures or in your set uh, m, m beta or m, m m omega, and which stays above the thing. So this is really um, an equivalent of Felmer Krumkov. Um, And by a strike of luck, uh, um, Laurence Carcis was visiting Oxford last week, and it turns out that she was working on the exact same problem, but with, in, she was working on this side of the board, we were working on that side of the board, but in fact the results are the same. So there will be either two papers or one paper, we don't know yet, but uh, anyway. This consumption is somehow uniquely determined up to equivalence classes of Qs. Okay, but it's not unique. Um, because this combination of H and C bar, C star is not unique, and you can come up with easy examples, which I'll skip now. Um, so it's quite interesting to consider an extra problem, where you look at possible H's, and then inf over P's. So it's quite natural to consider then this further problem. And what's nice here is that if you, this is now just a, a, a robust utility of maximization of, of utility of consumption. This set here, okay, it has nothing to do with your set of super hedging. Uh, somehow you, you disentangle the two problems. You, you, the super hedging strategies will have to super hedge either on some set or according to some quasi true sense. But then when you think about, um, optimization of the super hedging, so how to choose, a, how to pick your optimal super hedging strategies, um, then you can give yourself any other set of uh, subjective measures which, which allow you to decide on your, on your criterion. And theorem will be that. Uh, so at the moment we have this for bounded utility, so it has to be measurable in, um, in omega, concave in y, etc. <coughs> there exists an optimal H. Um, and if you assume compactness of this and strict concavity, you can get uniqueness of the optimal uh, consumption strategy. And this uh, very much relates to Marcel's paper and then a uh, paper by um, Blanchard and Cassius. Okay. 
I do not have time to talk about two more things, which I was hoping at least to mention. Um, the one is information quantification. Okay? The idea being that having a filtration which is greater than a filtration, so suppose G0 is greater than F0, and you want to price how big this, this difference is, um, really just, you can, in the pathway setting, this is equivalent to restricting the set of trajectories. So having information is really nothing more, but allow, it allows you to zoom in on a part of the larger space. So instead of considering all paths, all paths you can only consider a subset of paths, um, which are the atoms of this new, new sigma algebra. And with this setup, you get the pricing hedging duality for the information <coughs> straight away. Okay, so where the martingale medicine also are on these atoms. And you can use old results by uh, really Roge and Landers and Roge, which goes back to Boylan and Neveu, of then introducing uh, metrics on the space of sigma algebras. So you can, you can think of a metric between uh, F0 and G0, which is somehow defined by inf soup. Okay, so house of dark metric, and that allows you to um, have some pricing for the information sense of, and you can link this to the super hedging prices uh, and, and, and say which, which type of information is somehow uh, more uh, appealing from the point of view of super hedging. And last but not least, uh, if you're interested in then how to do a dynamic estimation of, of the super hedging is when you just see data coming in and you try to build consistent estimators, of those objects, then you'll have to ask me in the break. I'll stop here. Thank you. So uh, everything here is in a discrete time uh, setting. Uh, what can you do in a continuous time setting, which means that you have to replace the finite dimensional space uh, Rd by uh, the infinite mm. dimensional space of continuous function uh, with values in Rd? Okay, so the, 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 the honest answer is that um, we've tried, and I don't know, there's, 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 there are two things which happen in continuous time. Okay. Um, the one is that this idea of, which to me was quite natural, of Selecting uh, paths which are feasible is somehow tricky. If you think about this, continuous martingales live on a very particular subset of continuous paths. But typically, uh, those sets are, I mean, if you take their closure, you get all continuous functions. Okay? So somehow, um, from the robust point of view, you're, you're specifying paths, but you have a very strong belief, you know, because in a way, if you, so if you specify, you can specify Black Scholes pathwise. Uh, but then, if you if you consider an epsilon ball around your paths, then somehow everything breaks down. Well, here there is much more subtle. So so somehow you have to embrace that in a different way. There is a recent paper. So and this this has to be reflected in the set of trading strategies. So you cannot consider simple trading strategies. So you have to consider something that that goes back to what uh, Vladimir Wolf was doing. Somehow limb infs of the sums of of simple hedging strategies as your hedging instruments. There's a recent paper by Michel Cooper, Ludwig Tankpi, and one more co-author, maybe from last week, um, where they, so we've, we've, we've tried, there, there are two or three papers when we tried this and we didn't get the right duality. Somehow the, the right duality should be one that, like here you get Della Morton Willinger, you should get Black Scholes pricing if you, if you assume that your paths are only Black Scholes. That to me is the, the somehow the, 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 um, the sanity check and they, they finally get that. So, uh, there's, there's some, some hope. Uh, what you can do here, if you want to go infinite dimensions, you can consider, so I was having finitely many options, but you can, everything writes, goes through, essentially, if you have infinitely many options. Um, some things change, but a good way of doing this is, again, having this dynamic extension, which is now infinitely dimensional, but you then look at the measure valued martingales that Alex, uh, no, that Mat Matthias and Sigurd were talking about, and that somehow gives you the correct way of, of of understanding these infinite dimensional processes now. Uh, but you can still do the DPP and these this things here. Okay. 
just a small question about the embedding. So uh, in the quasi-sure case, it's quite clear to me in the sense that you have the law, as you said, they are the joint law. So because in the quasi-sure setting, you select a class of probability. So in the, in the pathways case, you cannot select a class of probabilities. So it, does it have to go through the, the thing that you show that you find a particular subset of paths which correspond to the selection of the um, class of probabilities? like you did with Johannes? Uh, if you want to connect the two, yes. But if you just want to stay on this board, then no. You, you just, um, it goes through the star operation. Okay, so you add all the paths, and then you take the star, and they somehow it throws away the, the natural paths, and you just have to show that the omega hat star is projected on the, on the first components is still omega star. Another 